About 300 kilometers southeast of Halifax, Nova Scotia, sits an island of sand. Appropriately named Sable Island, this small crescent-shaped island is home to magnificent wild horses, as well as the world's biggest breeding colony of gray seals. But with the potential impact of climate change on sensitive coastal areas, can a small island made entirely of sand survive the forces of nature in the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean? On this episode, we talk to scientists with new research examining the future of Sable Island. Welcome to a new episode of Simply Science, the podcast that talks about the amazing scientific work that our experts at Natural Resources Canada are doing. My name is Joel Ull, and joining me is my co-host, Barb Ustina. Barb, how are you? I'm, I'm doing just fine. I'm really looking forward to this episode. It sounds, uh, it sounds pretty fascinating so far. Oh, it does. Me too. So before doing research for this episode, were you aware at all of Sable Island? Yeah, as a matter of fact, in a, in a former life, when I was working uh, in broadcasting, uh, I almost went out there to do a story on the wild horses, and I, I Googled the island. I did all kinds of research, and I got really, really excited to do the story, and the story fell through. So I was really disappointed. So it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of a return for me in a way. So I, I do know a little bit about Sable Island, but I certainly have never been out there. Yeah, I mean, it would be so amazing to go there. Like I was looking at pictures online. What got me? I mean, there's like pictures of those ho horses on the beach, and it's it's beautiful. But it's the pictures at night that I saw. The ones where like there's no light pollution from like so it really is like starry skies, like you wouldn't believe. It's it's absolutely stunning. I can't even imagine what it would sound like if you were staying there overnight and like looking at the stars in the sky, and would you hear the winds and the waves from both sides? It would just it just captures the imagination, and it's no wonder that scientists have, have focused on this island for, for a good amount of time, actually, almost since it was, you know, uh, written history about the island back in the 1700s. They were talking about, will this island survive? So uh, this has been a concern for scientists for, for a long time already. Yeah, and it seems like history is continuing and is, is being made today with researchers from both Natural Resources Canada and from Parks Canada collaborating on research now. Um, like, I don't think I've ever been as excited to, uh, to cover a podcast. Should we uh, bring in our guests? Let's do it. So joining us today are Jordan Emer and Dan Keller. Guys, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having us. So can we start by, uh, maybe you guys can tell us a little bit about what you do. Uh, let's start with Jordan. You are a research scientist with the Geological Survey of Canada. What does your work entail? I can wear a few different hats. Mostly I do research in the coastal zone, I guess you could call it. So really focused on um, a lot of my background is in coastal geomorphology, which is just kind of studying how the coast, ge the coastal geology changes with, with time and, and different Forces acting on it. I work um, since I started with NRCAN. I've been uh, working a lot with uh, inner self geology as well. So usually using a lot of remotely sensed data from boats um, or from satellites, and balancing that with a lot of the uh, onshore coastal work, which is uh, tramping around in beaches and dunes and making observations. Interesting. Uh, and Dan, you're an ecologist with Parks Canada. What's your expertise? Yeah, so I'm the park ecologist for Sable Island National Park Reserve. And my expertise is, is actually more on the quantitative side. So I have a background in statistics and in modeling. Excellent. Now, the two of you are doing some work together on Sable Island, which is off the coast of Nova Scotia. And uh, for those of us who have never been there, and I'm sure that most of our listeners have never been there, um, can you set the scene for us a bit? What's it like there? It's just like... It just looks like such a magical place. Yeah. S Sable Island is one, one of Canada's furthest offshore islands. It's 300 kilometers from Halifax, which is where we fly out of. But the closest point of land is 170 kilometers. So it's really out there in the Atlantic Ocean. And you feel the full brunt of those oceanic forces when you're standing on the beach. The island is really well known locally, nationally, and even internationally. 
as a as a location. Um, part of the maritime history is a bit more somber because there were a lot of shipwrecks in and around Sable Island during the Age of Sail, as it sits somewhere on the track between uh, what were the colonies on the eastern side of North America and the Old World, England and France and so on. So there are over 300 recorded shipwrecks. And then in more recent times, it's well known as the location of the famed and iconic wild horse population of Sable Island. Jordan, so you, from a sort of geographical point of view, what makes this island so unique? Right. There's, Dan gets to do all the magic and talk about horses, and I, I get to talk about sand grains and glaciers and stuff. I, I get it. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it, uh, the the story of Sable actually it it does trace itself back tens of thousands of years. So um, it's a story of, of glacial advance and retreat. So it, over the last several ice ages, glaciers have pushed um, ice sheets have pushed a, an immense amount of sand and gravel out to the the edge of the shelf, which is where the Sable Bank sits, which Sable Island sits on top of. And all this um, advance and retreat just kept pushing more and more um, sediments until the the final, the last ice age that we know happened around, you know, 20,000 years ago. Just as the ice was retreating, it did one little extra re-advance, and that kind of pushed the last little bit of sediment up on top of this bank and built built the island um, that we know as Sable Sable Island today. So it's a it's a story about ice being pushed to the edge of the the edge of the shelf. And um, and then as that right ice retreated, the, the sea level was actually much lower. So Sable Island itself is humongous. It's probably 10 times larger than it is today. And over the last 10,000 years or so, as sea level rose, the island has generally changed shape and, and um, the sands have been better and better sorted as, as, the, as, as the ocean has, has been sorting this, um, the sediment and turned it into the Sable Island that we know and love today. So it, what's really incredible about the island itself is it, it's almost entirely composed of sand. There's not not a, a iota of bedrock uh, that you can find out there, and there's uh, very little bits of gravel here and there as well. So um, it, it, it's really fascinating. Wow, it, it sounds incredible. Now tell me a bit about the work that, that you're doing there, the research. Sure. I mean, uh, we, we've been, since those sands are, have been sorted for so long, we're, we continue to sort them by shape and color. And I spent a lot of time, no, just kidding. You know, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I do manage uh, most of the conservation programs that happen on Sable Island National Park Reserve. So that includes collaborating with some of the longstanding research programs and researchers who have been studying gray seals. It's the large, world's largest breeding population for gray seals. They've been studying horses. It's been an important center for atmospheric research. It uh, has been and continues to be a weather station that's been operated by the Canadian government for a long time now. And um, I actually moved out to Nova Scotia to take a job with uh, Sable Island National Park Reserve. And when I started, it was as it was as an operations coordinator. So that's a very different. That was a di- very different job than I have today. Um, it involved uh, a lot of things from fixing broken pipes and driving around and, and finding, uh, you know, unexploded ordnance and uh, and uh, finding runways to land planes on. But while I was doing that, my background in, in coastal geomorphology and, and geology, I was always kind of, I was fascinated by the island, but always kind of coming up with uh, <laughs> research uh, projects and, and programs in my head. So... It was nice to always to, to be on the island for um, months at a time and, and make all these observations and kind of take those observations with me to my current position. Now, are you looking at archival photographs as well to sort of do a comparison of, of the past to the present uh, to get sort of monitor the, the level of erosion? Right. So that that's the, that's the current uh, project that we're just uh, in the process of publishing right now. So there's a there is a really great record of of air photos that have been collected over the island historically since uh, the late 50s, and uh, what we were able to do with uh, in partnership with the Nova Scotia Community College out in in um, Middleton there was uh, was digitize them and and 
you call it uh, georectify. So basically, you're putting this into a common space um, so that you can compare these air photos over time and actually do measurements with uh, with these air photos. And um, so with Nova Scotia Community College and partners, other researchers at, at Natural Resources Canada and, and with uh, Sable Island National Park Reserve, um, like Dan, we were able to sort of piece together how the coastlines changed of, of Sable Island and the island itself over the last 60 years or so. And I guess um, just uh, following up on that, uh, what, what have you learned? What, what are these images uh, telling you? Um, well, lots. <laughs> One thing that's uh, that sort of the underlying picture, and and this is not a surprise to anybody who spent an appreciable amount of time on the island. Um, so uh, what the underlying picture is one of net shoreline retreat. So generally, the coast is eroding there. So we, we kind of knew this from a geologic perspective, as we were talking about earlier, as sea level has risen over the last 10,000 years, the island has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. But we now trying to fine tune that um, that picture to, to the scale of decades over the last few decades. We're we're actually ascribing rates now to to this uh, to this shoreline retreat. And um, what we're finding is that in general, the whole coastline along the southern coast is retreating, and that is offset a little bit by the north coast of the island. It's seeing a little bit of advance, but overall net around the whole of the island it is in general the coastline is retreating and what's interesting is we were able to not only look at the, the actual like the shoreline itself so where the ocean meets the land but we we took it one step further and we looked at what's called a foredoom so it's sort of like the first kind of real chunk of the island if you want to call it that is where the where the beach meets the land um, and we we looked at how that is migrating over that same time period and that, that is a much more nuanced sort of uh, result. And, and there's a lot, and it tells you a lot about how the island itself is evolving with, um, with these changing conditions in the ocean. And um, one, one interesting find, like we don't need to talk about all of it because I, I could. <laughs> but uh, one interesting finding is that um, there was a big lagoon that turned into a lake that has since been infilled with sand al along the southern shore. And all of a sudden, as, as that all infilled with sand, that became an available source of sediment to, to continue to build that dune. So even though all the, the coastline is retreating on that southern coast, that dune is actually growing and moving landward at the same time. So there's a bit of a conflicting signal there. So it's just really interesting. And it's really, it's, it's interesting to think back, uh, recorded history for the island, which starts more or less in, in 1801 with the first permanent settlement. And we've, we've got written records of how the island has changed in that period. So between 1801 and now, we have some vague idea of what was happening since the last uh, retreat of the glaciers. But this project really let us quantify the change that, that many people have observed on the island. And it's not uniform. And there have been some really large scale changes in particular areas where freshwater ponds used to exist and have now disappeared with the loss of that protective foredoom. But for us at the National Park Reserve, we're still faced with the basic question of, will this park be here in the future? And this is a question people have been asking for a long time. And back in 1899, they were worried that the island was going to disappear and become an even greater hazard to navigation. And that led to uh, discussion about what the options would be to save the island, including um, armoring the coastline with rocks. And what they settled on was a great tree planting exercise to try to stabilize the island. And that didn't go very well. In fact, all those trees died. So here we are in uh, 2021. Sorry, Dan, jumping in there. There's there's one. There's one left. <laughs> it was planted later in the 50s. <laughs> oh, okay. Pardon me. Sorry. And uh, calling it a tree is a bit generous since it's really about mid thigh high. But anyway, here we are in 2021. We're still scratching our heads wondering what is the evolution of this island? Is it on a, a path to disappearance or should it be something that will persist? And how is sea level rise and climate change factoring into that equation? It's interesting too, because, because this is a question that has been asked for so long, there's been a lot of hypotheses around 
what what is the what is the ultimate trajectory of the island and they they range from it's it's migrating east through time and it's going to disappear into the gully as all the sand just gets dumped into the to the gully which is the marine protected area there or it's maintaining itself by this complex web of sediment being transferred around the island and over the island and then back around the other spit or my favorite which is I don't know if you've heard the term Occam's razor, but it's just the simplest is usually the, the, is the right explanation. But uh, it's actually just sitting there. And as sea level rise, parts of the island disappear. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, we were able to kind of, the, the data, that the results that we produced weren't totally suited to, to answering that question, but we were able to kind of at least point in some directions. And in general, what the, the data that we produced looks like um they're the results that we produce it looks like uh that sort of closed circulation may be happening or it again that simple explanation that as sea level rise it just kind of you just lose a little bit more island might be the might be the the, the trajectory that the island is on well jordan what you and others have explained to me is that if the island is losing sand through wind the wind blows the sand away so we need a source of sediment and that's a function of the wave action, but also of the, the, I suspect, the currents around the island, which have always been a bit of a mystery to me, because I know we have a major currents far to the east pushing uh, northwards, the Gulf Stream, and then major currents to the west coming down from Labrador. But yet there's a, a more complex interplay that's happening in the island, and people talk about throwing a, a boot or a piece of trash and then seeing it reappear, having completely circumnavigated the island. And that's one of the things that that I'm worried about is are, if there are any changes to the current patterns due to climate change pushing the Gulf Stream um, further offshore or what have you, what that would mean for the ability of the island to still get that sediment that it needs. I, w- I should note that we don't advocate any visitors to the island to throw trash in the ocean. <laughs> I think this is previous experiments that... Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, but yeah, and, and, and that's something that we touched upon. So I've alluded to a paper that is, is coming out soon. Um, the, one of the more complex studies on offshore currents has shown that uh, there, there's a, there seems to be an, an eastward current on the south shore, um, off, sorry, off the south shore of Sable Island that ends in a, in a gyre. That, so it's not quite at the gully which is further east of, of the island, but, um, but in that general area. And that's, if we're going to get into the nitty gritty, that's, that's actually, that current kind of supports what our findings are, is that everything seems to be moving towards the east on, on the south beach. Um, and then maybe that gyre is actually a, uh, is a source of sediment, like Dan says, um, and maybe in major storms that can get pushed up on the beach and, and continue to keep, Sable Island uh, 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 moving. Wow, that's very interesting. Okay, so this is a little bit off, off topic, but we can't we can't talk about Sable Island without at least asking the question, even though that's not your expertise. Uh, the horses, where did they come from? Great question. We have a pretty good guess, although for a long time people thought they had swum from ships that had shipwrecked off the coast. But in fact, uh, the best evidence comes from some written records from the middle of the 1700s where uh, there were two merchants who bought horses and transported them to the island, uh, Boston merchants. And in the latter case, uh, we believe those actually came from Acadians who were dispossessed of their property in the middle of the 1700s. Some of those horses were bought by this merchant and dropped off on the island. But, But keep in mind, people used to do this all the time with sheep and other livestock because these islands were free of predators and it was a commercial venture. They thought they would drop them off come back and harvest them and make a lot of money. But I think they underestimated just the difficulty of getting to Sable Island and also the fact that there were many other shipwrecked fishers and, and other folks who arrived on the island who needed a source of food. So some of those uh, some of those animals who were dropped off that just disappeared, cows and goats and what have you. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah, thank you for uh, indulging me with that question. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about your work process. So the, the two of you, how, how do you work together? What's a typical day on the island look like? 
Well, in the, in the days when Jordan also worked for Parks Canada, it was fun to to collaborate on some of these idea generating. So we would, um, I remember Jordan taking me out in the Jeep at low tide and then digging around with a, a shovel at some of these old soils that are on the beach. And that was sparked some discussion about, well, how did they get there and what's offshore of the island? And how do we figure out what the, what that geological history of, of Sable Island is? Dan got to experience some classic geology, drive to a spot and dig a hole. Um, <laughs> I think we still have those samples wrapped in tinfoil marked this way up in the freezer on, on Sable, don't we, Dan? Really well, got hopefully it. not in the food freezer. Mm, yeah, <laughs> no, that's a sample freezer, I'm sure. <laughs> So, so for th this work involved a bit of uh, detective legwork just to find the imagery. So when we arrived, we didn't have the, the full historical record of images. We didn't know what existed and where they were. So I think at one point I had to call in a favor from someone who worked for Parks Canada in Ottawa to physically walk over to the National Air Photo Library and verify whether or not these air photos existed. And we found them. We found the old ones. Uh, there, and we were able to get them scanned and then sent to us. And then the rest of the imagery existed in various places. But there's one set we never found. And there's a map. I have this map from 1983, and we know there was imagery created at that time, but but the originals have disappeared. So that, unfortunately, is a gap in our multi-decadal uh, data stream. But uh, the, the, the work that we're, we're in the process of sort of finalizing right now um, this air photo historical analysis work. It, it's not very <laughs> exciting, unfortunately. It's a lot of desktop work, so we can't jazz it up too much. But I am looking forward to, uh, we do have some future collaborations in the work. We're um, working with some of my old colleagues on modeling sort of future trajectories of the island, so getting a better handle of how the island itself is evolving, but also getting a better handle of how infrastructure, how best to place infrastructure, what effect it's having on the on the small, sort of smaller scale um, wind flow patterns and how sediment is transported around the island because wind blown sediment is obviously a, a, a huge component of, uh, of daily life out there. Um, you can't escape it. So, and, and I, I did have the opportunity to do some field work with my uh, NRCAN hat on, uh, that was, I guess, late, 2019, Dan, um, right. and that was again. That was a classic coastal geomorphology trip where you just kind of you you start your day. You look at some lidar or some you know elevation maps, and you look at some air photos, and you put a point on a map, and then you just go and you just walk around and do a lot of arm waving and a lot of pontificating, and uh, and uh, and then you know write it up in a report. <laughs> oh, that reminds me of the first conversation I ever ever had with a a geomorphological scientist who I was trying to get advice about some of these issues on. He said, oh, yeah, just, just have somebody come to the island and walk around and they'll be able to give you their opinion, which to me, coming from a quantitative background, I thought, is that really how they do science over there? Science. <laughs> but I learned so much on that trip that Jordan was talking about with himself and another coastal geomorphologist just walking around. And visually, they can they can describe what's happened in an area just by looking at the patterns of the sand, the striations, the layering, and so on. So I wouldn't call myself a, a geomorphologist, but I've got a few nuggets that I pull out from time to time when I need to impress someone. Oh, definitely. Now, it sounds like it's uh, quite a collaboration, uh, the two of you working together. And uh, are there... Things that you can do working collaboratively that, that you're not able to do if you're working individually. I think you've touched on some, some of those things already. But how, how does working collaboratively lead to, you know, different ideas of doing things or different ways of doing things and, and just sort of the sum of the parts are better working collaboratively than individually? Well, it's easy for me to start out answering this because we are heavily reliant on the expertise from outside scientists for all the work that we do. So we're not trained in coastal geomorphology. We're not trained in image analysis. So to be able to get this project together took all those different expertises together. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gotten this project off the ground. I think part of it, too, is just um, uh, the expansion of our networks as well. Like uh, 
I had worked with the uh, NS, uh, sorry, Nova Scotia Community College um, prior to starting with Parks and and uh, making those connections and, and, the, and the incredible resources there, but also bringing all of my connections from NRCAN, from past academic colleagues. I'm I'm a I'm a science advisor with the Sable Island Institute, and that's one link we have between Parks and, and NRCAN as well. And so bringing this whole network of researchers together and um, all, all bringing different things to the table is it really helps these, these, these broad program, these broad research projects come together. I should also add that uh, Dan always makes me, you know, get more than one data point. His statistical background is, I can't just go and say, well, I see that thing there. So that must be how it is. <laughs> so we work together well that way. So based on your observations, the island is, is receding. Um, I don't know if that's the word you use for it, but, but is, is, is it possible that one day the island will disappear? Like the question was asked like 100 years ago, 150 years ago. Are we still asking that same question? Yeah, yes. Short answer, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we were able to do, it's almost, it's almost a shame to call it a model, but we were able to sort of look ahead about 20 years with this with this analysis and it does um it does show a pretty significant recession in parts of the the island in terms of the in terms of the coast but uh even 20 years uh into the future i was surprised when when you live out there um and dan can speak to this too it does sometimes feel like when it's a really big storm and it's coming at you from both coasts it feels like the island is very small <laughs> and it feels like there's just no way, uh, you know, like it's going to stick around forever. But the, the results from this analysis anyway, did, did, did kind of show that, yeah, the changes are real um, and, and they're significant in places, but there's, there's, there's lots of time here too. The island has been around for a long, long time. Um, and so we've got, a, we've got some time to figure it out, but uh yeah, it's still uh, it's still a, a, an open ended question as to um, what the the overall uh, trajectory is, um, and and the the thing we don't know too is is what what the the island change will look like in a in a scenario with accelerated sea level rise. We only know what what we found up until this point. Um, so with sea level rise uh, increasing the rate over the next hundred years, um, that might that might play a, a very different uh, role in how the island falls as well. Yeah, I, I would add to that, Jordan, that in many people's minds, the island is this curious mix of, of fragility and also resilience. So we see the effects of, of a single storm event on the island. You think, you know, how can that happen? And what does that mean for the future of the island? And what this project helped us do was to sort of take away those small episodic events and then look at what the, the long-term process has been over those 60 years. And from the national park perspective, this influences all the work that we do. It influences not just how the species can persist in this environment, but also how the humans can, can persist. So what is the future and the fate of the site where we have infrastructure on the island, which we need to maintain in order to welcome visitors and to protect the island? It affects our ability to have visitors come to the island because the runway itself is on the beach. And so that beach is changing. So it's important for us to know how it's changing in order to understand, well, can we continue to ma maintain and operate this place as we have in the, in the recent past? That's um, really interesting. Yeah, I never thought about the runway. Yeah, like how do you land on sand? So guys, if uh, people would like to know more about the work that you do uh, or about Sable Island, is there any resources available online? Uh, is there like websites, social media accounts to follow? Oh, yes. We at Sable Island National Park Reserve maintain both a website and a Facebook page. Uh, but there are many other resources beyond uh, the National Park Reserve, including a great uh, website produced by the Sable Island Institute. And there's a website by the Friends of Sable Island, all of which have great information about that place. Yeah, and I'm, I'm on Twitter. I, I just started it last year, <laughs> so I'm, I'm totally going to hawk it here. It's got two tweets, I think, so wait for that third. Um, but, uh, you know, there's also Geologic uh, Survey of Canada and NRCAN. Um, they do a lot of their stuff through uh, 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 Twitter as well. So I think that's uh, usually the more, like, uh, 
cutting edge of, of what's coming out from, from those, for those venues. Sounds good. We'll put the links in the description of the podcast. Make sure you subscribe to see Jordan's third tweet. Uh, <laughs> Jordan and Dan, thank you so much for uh, coming and chatting with us today. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you. you very much. Thank you so much. A lot of fun. That was a a really fun interview. Uh, Jordan and Dan seem like the kind of people you'd want to be stuck on an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean with, right? Yeah, no kidding. No, maybe we will make it out there one day. Maybe we can put a bug in their ear that you know, Simply Science can go out there and shoot a video with them someday or something like that. Would be amazing. Yeah, I mean, uh, right now during the quarantine, I'd settle for getting out of the house. But you know, blue sky, (laughs) I would love to go to Sable Island. It sounds absolutely amazing. I know what it's. Just goes to show it's part of our amazing country, too, like from coast to coast. It's just so many different places to go. I just wanted to mention uh, before we sign off that uh, Jordan and Dan, they're not working in isolation. They want to make sure that everybody knows that, you know, they're sort of continuing a, a long research tradition in a way. And they're building on a large body of scientific knowledge that's been gathered before them over the course of decades and centuries, really, um, by a wide range of scientists, naturalists and enthusiasts including NRCAN geoscientists and other federal government department research teams. So if our our audience wants to know more about the work that's been done, we have some links in the episode description. We have information on Sable Island itself, as well as as the work that's being done by both departments. So check out those links. If you like this episode, feel free to share it with your friends. And if you share over Twitter, make sure to tag us. There's at and our can science for our simply science account and um you can always tweet at us directly i'm at joel science and i'm at simply science b that's the letter b and i might remind everyone that simply science also has a website and a youtube channel which you should check out uh, we have in-depth articles of interest and videos that showcase the fascinating scientific work that we do at natural resources canada and this is just a taste of it today Um, And you can find those links in the episode description as well. Social media channels, too. Thank you, Barb. And thank you so much, everyone, for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. See you later. If you like this video, let us know with a thumbs up. Click on the logo below to subscribe to the Simply Science channel and click the bell icon to be notified when we upload new videos.